to uh, Psalms chapter 85. Psalms chapter 85. Tonight is a really important message, one that, uh, that, you know, this is something I really hope you all get. This is one of those messages, you know, I'd like for the whole world to hear. I'd like for all Baptists to get to hear this message. But you know what? Um, they're probably not all going to listen to me. But you know what? If I can at least get our church to listen to this, we're going to be doing pretty good. In fact, if I could get our church to listen to this, other Baptists would probably start paying a little bit of attention and maybe actually get some of these things. And um, I want us to go ahead and start reading. Uh, we're going to read all of Psalms chapter 85. And I want to point some things out to you in here. But it says, Lord, thou hast been favorable unto thy land. Thou hast brought back the captivity of Jacob. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sin, Selah. Thou hast taken away all thy wrath. Thou hast turned thyself from the fierceness of thine anger. Turn us, O God of our salvation, and cause thine anger toward us to cease. Wilt thou be angry with us forever? Wilt thou draw out thine anger to all generations? Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints. But let them not turn again to folly. Surely his salvation is nigh them that fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring out of the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yea, the Lord shall give that which is good, and our land shall yield her increase. Righteousness shall go before him, and shall set us in the way of his steps. Now this psalm right here, it's, uh, it's a very interesting one, but notice it talks about in the first verse, it says, Thou hast brought back the captivity of thy people Jacob. One thing that's it's so important, it's one of the reasons we need to study the Bible. You know, it's good to look at, you know, context of things. And in Psalms, you know, the Psalms are not in chronological order. And the Psalms aren't all even written by David. And a lot of the Psalms, and this Psalm in particular, it was more than likely written shortly after Israel's captivity in Babylon. And, you know, and one of the things I do that's just a huge help to me, every other year I read through a chronological Bible. And it really helps me because of the fact that, you know, whenever you read, uh, whenever you're reading the Bible, it's, it's not in chronological order. And it's real easy to kind of get lost in where you're at historically. And whenever you're reading the minor prophets, and even when you're reading a lot of Psalms, if you understand what's going on historically, it can really help you uh, learn some things from that. And so in this Psalm in particular, uh, it was probably written shortly after Israel's 70 year captivity. Because Israel had been so stinking wicked for so long, for 490 years, they didn't keep the Sabbath year. Every seven years, they were supposed to just, you know, they weren't supposed to, uh, you know, till the land and everything. They were supposed to give the ground rest. And they did not obey that for 490 years. So God said, you know what? I'm going to give the land her Sabbaths for 70 years. I'm going to, you know, you're going to get taken captive out of the land. So the land can rest for 70 years. This, that, was, that was part of the punishment. They had been wicked. But after that 70 years, God prophesied, I'm going to bring you, you, know, I'm going to bring you out of there. And that's exactly what God did. So they're after this. They're no longer captive. You know, the Medes and Persians are in charge right now. But if you remember, you know, Cyrus, he actually commissioned Israel to go back and rebuild their temple. He gave them permission to do that. We read about that in Ezra and Nehemiah. And so if, and if you go back and you might remember a while back in Sunday school, we went through Ezra and Nehemiah and we talked about a lot of these things, but you know, historically what had gone on, you know, Cyrus, he, he had commissioned them to rebuild the temple, but they didn't do anything about it right away. They just, you know, they, they had this opportunity. They'd been brought out of the land, something they'd been praying for. They're able to return to their own homeland you know, they've been crying about the fact that they, there is no temple there, that they're not able to, you know, keep the feast and do the sacrifices. And so God, he gives them this opportunity and they're not doing anything about it. And roughly t <clears throat> 10 years passes and they haven't done hardly anything. And so, you know, they, they end up finally, you know, ne Nehemiah, he's up, might remember he was the king's cupbearer. He was sad about the, you know, land being light waste and all that. And he went back there to kind of oversee some things. Nothing had been going on, uh, going on. And so, the, you know, they had some opposition when they tried starting. And so there was basically seven years where nothing got accomplished. They just, they did nothing. 
And, you, the, and then finally, when they started trying to do the work again, you might remember the enemies of Israel, they come along and they go and they tell the king, they tell Darius, I believe it was, that Israel uh, was basically planning a rebellion. They're trying to rebuild their walls because they're planning on trying to fight you. And so um, if you and if you go and if you read the story, you know, because now Darius is the one that's in charge and he goes back and finds in the records that Cyrus did, in fact, commission them to rebuild that temple. And so they ended up getting his blessing. But once again, you know, opposition kept coming up and Israel would stop and they would do nothing. And if you read the books of Haggai and Zechariah, God is rebuking Israel for not taking care of the house of the Lord, not doing what he has told them to do. They you know, said they had an opportunity. God made it so they could do it, but there was opposition. So they just kept quitting. They kept giving up. They just, they weren't even really trying even after all that God had done. And so when you read this Psalm here in chapter 85, okay, they're, they're not in captivity anymore, but Israel's not happy. Israel is still kind of miserable. And notice what he says there, you know, in verse five, you know, wilt thou be angry with us forever? Yeah, you turned again our captivity. You know, we're not in captivity anymore, but Lord, it's like, you're still mad at us. And you know, it's because he was, they weren't being obedient. They weren't rebuilding the temple. They weren't getting the house of the Lord ready. They were taking care of their houses. We read about in Haggai, but they weren't taking care of the house of the Lord. And God was upset about that. And then he says, you know, wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? You know, Lord, we want revival. We want to be able to rejoice in you again. We want to be able to be happy again. But the problem was it was not with God. It was with them. Here they were, they're sitting around wanting God to do a work. They're wanting revival to come so they can be happy. And the truth is what needed to be done so they could have revival had already been done. God had already done it. It says, it said right there, thou hast taken away thy wrath in verse three. You know, thou hast turned thyself from the fierceness of thine anger. In verse two, it said, thou hast forgiven the iniquity of the people. Thou hast covered all their sin. And I say all this as kind of introduction because I believe churches today, especially the independent fundamental Baptists, they are in the same position that Israel was. Churches right now, pastors all over America, good pastors. I mean, places with good doctrine. They have the right heart, but they're sitting around in a backslidden state begging for God to bring revival. I mean, they want revival in a bad way. I mean, churches, they'll have these, you know, month long fastings where everybody kind of takes turns fasting. You know, they'll have these prayer meetings, you know, every night that they're doing and what they end up doing, they end up planning a revival meeting and they're thinking, man, well, we've got to, we've got to have revival. Our church needs revival. I mean, they're backslidden. They know they're backslidden. They'll, they will admit that they're backslidden. They will admit their churches are not doing what they're supposed to do. They have these revival meetings. They'll have one after another. They have the prayer meetings, the church fast. But nothing is happening. No, nothing is changing. Why is this? Well, I, for, for, I think the main problem is they don't even know what revival is. And that's what I want to talk about tonight is what does revival even look like? What is revival and what does it look like? Because I'm afraid these people wouldn't know it if it hit them in the face. That was Israel's problem. They, I mean, it was a miracle when God, first of all, brought them out of captivity. And when God took a wicked king like Cyrus and put it in his heart to allow them to go back and to beautify the temple and to rebuild the walls. That was a miracle of God. Yet here they do, they go back and it's like they're sitting around wanting God to do something, but they're not wanting to do anything themselves. And God had revived them. God had brought them back. And yet they didn't even realize it. They're not even enjoying it. They're not doing what they're supposed to do. They're still in a backslidden state. So first of all, you know, what does revival even mean? And if you look in the Webster's 1828, there's several dictionaries, but the one that people are talking about, okay, if you go to a church and like, you know, you hear a preacher, we need revival. Okay. What he's talking about is the one definition that says renewed and more active attention to religion and awaiting of uh, an awakening of men to their spiritual concern. Okay, that's what most people are talking about. You know, that's what we need. We need revival. We need people to wake up, to wake up. We need people to start paying more attention to religion again and paying attention to the things of God. We need revival. And you know, I agree with that. 
Okay, I, I agree that we need that. I agree we need an awakening in our country. We need an awakening in our churches. But you know, there's another definition of revival. If you actually look up you know, the Hebrew word and its definition, I think it's really interesting. I think it's something that we need to understand. And I think it goes along with what we see here in Psalms 85 when he says, you know, wilt thou not revive us? Again, we sing the song, revive us again. But in the, you know, the Hebrew definition, it means to live or um, to be made alive, to give life, to quicken, recover, repair, restore to life, to save, to surely be whole. Now, do a lot of those phrases and those terms sound familiar? Isn't that what God did to us when we got saved? And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. That means we were brought to life. That means we were revived, didn't it? And it says in John chapter three, uh, John three fifteen, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. When you got saved, God gave you eternal life, right? What does that mean? It means you got revived. It means you got brought to life. So, you know, they don't, the, the thing that I think I'm afraid people don't understand is that if you're saved, then you've already been revived. And notice what he says here too. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sin. Is that not what the blood of Christ does for us when we get saved? And when he does that, what happens? We are revived. We are brought to life spiritually. Thou hast taken away all thy wrath. He that believeth on him is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already. The Bible says, you know, uh, yeah, he that believeth not that Jesus is a Christ... I'm not quoting this right, but the wrath of God abideth on him. All right. And that the wrath of God is not on the saved. The wrath of God is not on the revived. So a per, what, you know, when we see that verse, wilt thou not revive us again? Thy people may rejoice in thee. Hey, I think God has already done that for us. When we got saved, we have already been revived. But once again, people today, I'm afraid they don't know what revival looks like. And they have decided something else is revival that is, that is not revival. And so, you know, I, I think what they've done is they've confused revival with revelry, basically. You know, you know what does revelry mean? You know, it means, you know, boisterous festivity. That, you know, that's what revelry is. And I'm afraid that's what these people are looking for. Because look, you know, what he says there in Psalms 85, Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? But wait a minute. Why shouldn't they have been rejoicing in Christ? I mean, look what God had already done for them. They should have been praising the Lord. Shouldn't we be praising the Lord wherever we're at? Shouldn't we be praising the Lord all the time, anytime? We see Paul and Silas, uh, they praised the Lord while they were in prison. They sang his praises. What made them do it? Because those guys had revival. Those guys were saved. And so they, and they, were, uh, you know, they were enjoying their revival. They were, they were living it. But unfortunately, we today, we think that revelry is revival, boisterous activity, fun, excitement. We've decided that a good time is revival, but it's actually, if you go in the book of Acts, I think everyone would agree is, I mean, how things should be. It's what people are looking for. We're going to see that what people consider revival today is a total opposite of what we see in the book of Acts. And so what is it that passes off as revival today? And listen, if y'all have been around church for very long, you know, you, you know, this is true. You know what I'm going to be telling you here is true, but you know what passes off as revival today? Big crowds. You know, that, that's a sign of revival, but you know what? That's a big crowd can be easily manufactured. You know, if, if we would just, you know, bring in the bounce houses and bring in the dunk tanks and bring in the, you know, the singers and the entertainers, we could have a big crowd. We could have some revelry. We could have some excitement. We could have all those things, but like I said it, it's easily manipulated. I remember years ago, um, there was a church that we fellowshiped with that they had gone through a nasty split. I mean, they lost a bunch of people, and they were going to have a revival. And man, that and they were that preacher. He was praying for revival. You know, they needed they needed revival. Their church was struggling. It was going through a hard time. And so, you know, and my dad wanted to be a blessing while they're having that revival. And so we brought a group from our church. We brought 70 people to that revival meeting. 
And I remember we were there, and man, the people were just all excited because you know there was I mean, you know, seventy visitors. You know, there was a lot of people at that meeting, and you know, and everybody's fired up, and you know, and you know, and, and the people from my dad's church, you know, they they were a lively bunch, and you know, we we kind of brought a good time, and I guess you could say. And I remember, you know, the pastor he got up he got up there, and before the guy preached, and he was, he's just kind of standing there, and he's like, he's kind of looking around, and he's like, I was just talking to brother so and so, and I was like. This is what it, this is what it used to be like all the time, you know. He's like, I'm I'm feeling some of the old, you know, like like it's coming back. It was like he felt like their church is having a revival because they had a big crowd that night. The only problem is, you know, that next Sunday, you know, we're all back at our old <laughs> at our church. You know, we weren't there, and so you know, now what are we going to do? But it was like that church was so fired up because they had a full house, but that's not revival. Oh, and by the way, that church. It already closed down and is no longer in existence. Uh, they ne- they never got their revival that they were looking for. But they did. They, you know, they think a big crowd is revival, and you can you can manufacture that thing. A lot of these churches that are just begging for revival, whenever they have these big meetings, I mean, they'll send flyers out. You know, they're calling all these preachers. Hey, you know, come you know come to our revival meeting. You know, bring a busload of people to our revival meeting because if we can have a big crowd, it'll get our people fired up. Maybe we'll have some revival. If we could have a big crowd, we could have a good time in church. We could have some re- revival or revelry. You know, you know, th- we could have. That's what we're looking for. But once again, you can manipulate those things and it's not revival. It's not what God's looking for. You know, excitement is what people think is revival, you know, laughing, crying, shouting. And listen, there's guys good. Listen, if you want to get your people laughing, if you think, you know, just, you know, cause listen, some churches you go to, the people are just kind of dead. Everybody looks like they're about to fall asleep. And you know, we just need some life in the pews. And so, you know, we're going to get Sam Gipp and have him do one of his stand up comedy routines that he calls sermons. And we're going to have him come and preach so we can get our people laughing. And let me tell you, he knows how to get laughs out of people too. You know, he, and he does a good job of that. And people enjoy that. You've got other preachers that are real good at getting the people shouting. You get some of these camp meeting guys that know, you know, they're, man, they're fired up. I mean, they're all ready to go. They can get people whooping and hollering. They know how to tell the stories. They know how they, there's other preachers that know how to get everybody crying. I mean, man, they know how to tell the sad stories. I mean, they had the horrible thing that happened in their past and they have told that story 10,000 times in 10,000 churches and they are experts at telling that story and they'll have all the women crying and even some of the men crying. And boy, we've got a big emotional fest going on. We've got excitement. I mean, the altars are getting filled. I mean, we've got tear marks all over the place. Everybody's blowing their noses. This is revival. And everybody's just thrilled to, you know, thrilled to death. Man, we had revival. Really, what happened? People were crying. Altars were full. The pews were full. You know, and they, but so you can manipulate all those things. And some of these guys are good at it. You know, the public decisions. No matter how temporary they are. And, and some guys, are, they're good at that too. I mean, they're good at putting the high pressure on the invitation. You better get right with God. You know, rapture could come tonight. And, you know, you don't want to have to stand before God and make things right then. You know, you need, you need to take care of these things. And we would have, I remember, you know, my dad's church, we'd have these revival meetings sometimes. And people, you know, the preacher get up there, people get convicted. And everybody would start testifying. And, you know, and there, there's always that one woman in the church that always gets it going. You know, that one woman that gets caught up in the emotion. And she starts crying and testifying. And then somebody else does it. And then, you're, you know, and then everybody starts apologizing. And we would have these things. They used to be lining up. My wife, she'd be at the piano playing. And she'd have people like lining up to come apologize to her for, because they all wanted to ask for her forgiveness because she made them mad and they were angry at her for years. And, you know, it would make her feeling terrible by the end of the thing. But I'm not lying. She had a line of people one time waiting to come apologize to her. It was one of the funniest things I ever saw. She didn't think it was funny real then, but we laugh about it now. But I mean, and, and people think that's revival. I'd have them do that to me too, where they would come, you know, you know, Pastor Tommy, I just, I just want to get things right with you. And I'm like, you know, I, I just want to apologize. And I'd be like, what did you do to me? Uh, I wasn't mad at you, you know. Well, you did this to me, and I've been bitter at you. Oh, well, thanks, you know. Boy, you know, and I just wanted to get this off my chest. And, you know, I, I just, I want to get right with God. And I'm just like, I didn't even know you were mad at me. 
Couldn't you have just asked for God's forgiveness and just not told me about it? Because now I feel like garbage. And, but, but you know, it was just an emotional fest. And people would. I mean, I, I always hated that. I mean, yeah, but people think that's revival. I mean, we got to get the people testifying. We got to get the people hugging and crying and, and doing all these things. That's what revival is. But the problem is, too, next year when the evangelist comes through again, they're all apologizing to me again and other people again for the same stupid things. And it's like, you know what? You didn't change last year. And something tells me you're not going to change this year either. And the things, you know, it's, it's just, but man, people eat that stuff up and they do. They think it's revival and preachers, I mean, literally pastors, because they think that's what revival is, they're desperate for it. And it's like, they'll do whatever they can to conjure it up, man. We're going to have, we're going to have to have an all night prayer meeting. And listen, I'm all for an all, you know, if, if, if you feel the need to have an all night prayer meeting, I don't think that's wrong. You know, I don't think it's wrong to do the fast and all these things, but they're doing this in desperation to see a service where the pews are full, where people are laughing, shouting, crying, where people are confessing and testifying. And they have decided that that is revival, but that is not revival. And, and where do you see that in the Bible? Where do you, you know, where did that, where does that come from? These big emotional fests. When do you see a big emotion fest going on in the book of Acts? You don't see it, but it is. It's a big thing today. And somehow they got the idea from the book of Acts. And I think I know how they got it. That the moving of the Holy Spirit is something that just randomly happens at God's will. But let, listen, and, and what is that? Because that, they read the book of Acts. You know, they were all within one accord in one place and they're all praying. And then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit came through as a rushing mighty wind. And, you know, they all got filled with the Holy Ghost and they all started preaching. All these things started happening. And we just need to pray that, you know, we got to get together. We all got to get one accord, one place. If we could all just start getting in one accord and getting along. Y'all need to get right with each other. Because if we would do that and if we could all get here at the same time, if we could fill the place up and all get along. Holy Spirit's going to come rushing through here and a mighty rushing wind. And all of a sudden, man, we're going to start speaking, you know, not speaking in tongues. We're Baptist, but we're going to start acting like Pentecostals. You know, we're going to start shouting and singing and whooping and hollering and rolling out in the aisles. When have you ever seen that? And I've been at some of these camp meetings. too. I was at a camp meeting one time where, man, it really got on. Man, a revival broke out. I'm not lying. First, this one guy, he got, he pulls his hanky out and he goes skipping around the tent around the whole place while these people are singing. And they just kept singing the song over and over and over again. And as the song was going, people were getting more and more excited. And before you knew it, one of the guys, he gets up there and he grabs, they had a Christian flag and he grabs it and he's like waving the Christian flag. And then another guy would come over and take his place and he'd wave the Christian flag. And then all of a sudden, everybody just started going around hugging each other. And I had people like coming up and hugging me. And it was really weird. And I remember one guy jumped up on the, you know, he just like jumped up on the chair and for some reason, you know, when he jumped up on the chair, you know, he couldn't just jump up on there, you know, face that, you know, he had to face the crowd and wow, you know, he's like screaming and stuff. And, and when it got done, I was like, man, wasn't that great, man, the Holy Spirit sure moved. And listen, when the Holy Spirit moved in, all right, the reason we see it kind of look like a random event, understand God had, or Jesus had prophesied that, Hey, I want you to tarry in Jerusalem until I send the comforter. Okay, now, when did the comforter leave? Okay, is he not always with us? Why are we always sitting around waiting for him to show up? Are we not indwelt by the Holy Spirit? So why, why do we think we need to conjure up something? And listen, you can do it with the right kind of music. You can conjure it up. There are some guys, man, they are the masters at the invitation. They know how, you know, they'll tell you the scary stories before everybody stand, close your eyes. You know, I don't want anybody to look around. You might meet the Lord tonight. Are you ready for that? You know, and they got the music playing and they get the mood all right. And man, before you know it, man, people are you know, crying and running to the altars and confessing things and they know how to get stuff out of people. And they call it a move of the Holy Ghost when that happens. But I'm telling you, these things are nothing more than just an emotion fest. This is, this, is, this is emotion. This is manipulation. It's not the real thing. And somehow people got the idea that that's what it is. But listen, what did revival look like in Acts? Because we do see that when we got saved, we got quickened. 
We got revived. We've already been brought to life. We already have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us. So why are we looking to be revived? Why are we looking for the Holy Spirit? These things have already happened. They're already with us. If we don't have revival, the problem is, or if we're not doing what we're supposed to do, the problem is we are not walking in the Spirit. That's the problem. If, the, if things are not being done the way they should, it's because we are not walking in the Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit. We've already been revived. If things aren't going the way they're supposed to, if we're not doing what we're supposed to do, it's not because, you know, God just hasn't decided to show up. It's not because we're, just, you know, the Holy Spirit is just not doing anything. It's because we're walking in the flesh. We are not doing what we're supposed to do. We are giving the flesh what it wants instead of giving the Holy Spirit what it wants. I, I don't believe... Re revival was ever supposed to stop, you know, and I, I believe what was going on in Acts is supposed to be going on now. But if it's not, it's not because the Holy Spirit's not here. He's here. It's not because we have not been revived. We've been revived. We've been quickened. We're saved. So if these things aren't happening, if we're not doing what we're supposed to do, it's because we are in the flesh and nobody ever stops and thinks about that. What, you know, what's wrong with us? It's like, God, why aren't you reviving? Wilt thou not revive us, revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? Well, but what they're really saying is, Lord, won't you ever give us a you know, full crowd again so we can rejoice in you? You know, Lord, won't you get us all excited? Can't you make everything go great in our lives so we can rejoice? And they, that's what they're really saying. And so what did revival actually look like in the book of Acts? Well, this, uh, this isn't... Uh, turn over to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 23. I want to show you this verse because... Before, I, I don't. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but um, it, it's very interesting. And there's a lot of scriptures we can go to. We don't have time to go to all of them tonight. But in Colossians one verse twenty three, Paul's talking here. He says, "If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I Paul am made a minister." Do y'all see what Paul just said right there? Do you see that claim he just made? He just said the gospel was preached to every creature which is under heaven. Now, how did they do that? You want to know how they did that? Because when revival came, when the Holy Ghost came, do you know what happened? You know what happens when there's revival? You know what goes on when there is revival? It's not a big emotion fest. It's not a big thing where people are running around and jumping into baptistries and, you know, waving Christian flags and jumping up on the chairs, screaming and hugging each other. It's not, that's not what revival is. You know what they were did? It, when you read the book of Acts, what was it they were constantly doing when the Holy Spirit would show up? They would go soul winning. They were witnessing. They weren't all in a building together, you know, congregating together, just staying amongst themselves, having a good time amongst themselves. When the Holy Spirit came, they're going and they're preaching the gospel which is exactly what they were commissioned to do. And they did that. I mean, the word of God, it grew mightily. They were preaching. I mean, they were going all over the world. Everywhere they go, they're preaching the gospel. They're preaching the gospel. That's what it looks like when there's revival. There's going to be preaching of the gospel. Not behind the pulpit, in the assembly, in the church. I'm saying outside of the church, there's going to be people preaching the gospel. And you know what? I wasn't alive during these days. But I remember right after we got married, my wife, or, um, we just got married and me and my dad, we went to a sword of the Lord conference. And I remember my dad was telling me about the sword of the Lord conferences and how they used to be and how, how big they were and what, a, what a big deal they were. And I remember we went to the sword of the Lord conference and there was like hardly anybody there. You know, it was a pretty good sized church, but like hardly anybody was there. Uh, it was really kind of disappointing. I remember my dad saying, you know, Back in the day, you know, in John R. Ice's day, it would be packed. Well, so I wasn't there for it, but I've had preachers tell me that back in John R. Rice's day, when they would have these conferences, one of the things that he would always do is he had all them preachers go out soul winning. They would have their meetings and stuff in the morning, and then you know what they did? They all got together, and they all went out soul winning. They don't do that anymore. That is not going on. I've gone, I've gone to so many, I go to all these conferences and things all over. I have my whole life. I have never seen a bunch of preachers after sitting all morning in service, stuffing their faces at lunch, going out and going soul. And you know what they do? They go take naps after that. 
that, that I have never seen that in my life. It used to go on all the time. They would all go sewing. But now, these guys, they go to these conferences to j basically just go rub shoulders with the big guys, you know, schedule meetings, you know, and be big shots. Nobody goes sewing at these things, but that's what they used to do. And interestingly enough, back then, people were getting saved like crazy. The churches were growing like crazy. And the meetings were packed out. But that is not going on. Okay, now the crowd I run with, they do that at their conferences. The one I'm going to this week, there's going to be, before any of the preaching and stuff goes on, they're going to be having a soul winning marathon where there's probably going to be a couple hundred people out knocking doors preaching the gospel. That is what goes on in a revival. There is lots and lots of soul winning, but what's going on in churches? They're all scaling back on the soul winning. They're backing off on it. They're not doing hardly any of it. They're substituting it, you know, with door hangers and things like that because, you know, they, they're tired of getting doors slammed in their face. They don't like the confrontation. People are just too scared. They're too bashful. But listen, what revival looks like is people are giving the gospel. Not the pastor in the service. I'm saying God's people are telling other people about Jesus. That's what revival looks like. And what we need, and if we are not preaching the gospel, it's just because we're not doing it. It's because we have just decided I don't want to do it. It's because we are in disobedience. It's because we are in rebellion. And we, you don't need to wait for the Holy Spirit to come on you and inspire you to go tell this person. You, know, you don't have to have this vision you know, and see this light above someone. And that's the person I'm supposed to go give the gospel to. You know what? You know what you need? You need what the scripture says. Go in all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And when you see an opportunity, man, you ought to jump on it. That's what revival looks like. When we're telling people about Jesus, and if, if, if we want to see God do great things, we've got to do what we're supposed to do. Okay? If we want revival, then you know what we need to do? We need to do what you're doing. We've, we're already saved. You know what we just need to do? We need to get obedient and be given the gospel, telling everybody we can. That's what they did. They did lots and lots of sowing. And I'm going to show you some verses on that here in a little bit. But I'm not going to yet because it'll it kind of when you look at those passages, it goes into one of my other points. So lots and lots of soul winning. That's what revival looks like. That is not go when they have revival meetings. Nobody goes soul winning. Most of these evangelists, these revivalists, okay, they'll come and they'll spend a whole week at a church. They will do nothing except preach, you know, an hour sermon each night and go golfing during the daytime. And sit around in their hotel, tweeting, you know, booking more meetings. These guys aren't out soul winning. They're not doing that type. They're not doing that type of thing. I, most of these evangelists, I don't think, hardly ever knock any doors. You know, and it, it's it's sad that that's how it is. But that that's just that's just the truth. These guys are nothing more than motivational speakers, is what they are. And what's sad is they get very well paid for it. And they do. They go. They collect their big love offering. And I can tell you some stories. And I could name some names about some of these people. I'm not going to name any names, but one man, there's, there's one in particular, this guy, he's one of the biggest hams and it's right in his name too. And this guy too, man, he is such a big talker, but look, I know some, I know some people that have had this guy in and that's exactly what he does. He walks into service, you know, five minutes after it starts, he get up, he does his thing and he puts on his good show and he leaves as soon as the service is over. He doesn't even talk to the people, he doesn't fellowship with the people. He doesn't go out soul winning during the week with the pastor. He doesn't do anything like that. He's just a big ham is all he is. And this, and this guy goes, and, but he's a, he's a big shot. He's convinced a lot of people he's a big shot. So you know what? When he goes places, there's a lot of people that will come to hear the big shot. There's a lot of people that will come to hear the big hand. And you know what they do? They do people say, oh, man, we had a revival. We had a revival. This is great. And, you know, and it's just like, no, that is not, that is not revival at all. And they do. And, and they think we got to get this guy in because he gets in the crowds. This guy gets the results. This guy gets the people crying. This guy gets the altars filled. You know, it's just, it's a joke. It's ridiculous. There is going to be, there's lots and lots of soul winning going on when there's revival. And if there isn't soul winning going on, it's not because the Holy Spirit's not around. It's not because you haven't been revived. You're saved. It's just because you're not doing what you've been told to do. And so we just need to keep that in mind. If you do, if you want the excitement, if you want book of acts experiences, you got to get out and you got to give somebody the gospel. You got to tell somebody about Jesus. And so look at acts chapter five and verse 40 acts chapter five in verse 40. So the next thing you see whenever, uh, there's revival is persecution. 
Look what it says in Acts 5.40. And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded them that they should not speak in the name of the Lord Jesus and let them go. And why did they beat them? Because they were speaking in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so they beat them so they wouldn't do it. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Sounds like these guys are having an emotional fest, doesn't it? You know, these guys are having a good time. These guys are shouting, they're rejoicing. But it was after they got beat. Not, they're not shouting and rejoicing because they had a big full crowd and the altars were full and people were crying and everybody loved them and accepted them and thought they were the greatest. You know why they were, they were excited? Because they were kind of worthy to suffer for Christ's sake. These guys, it sounds like they were revived. You know, they were just saved. They were saved and obedient. And it says in verse 42, after they got beaten for this and daily they were in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. So what happened? These guys, they're... they're they're soul winning. They get persecuted for it. But what do they do? They keep on soul winning. They keep on preaching the gospel. Going from house to house. And they did not cease. You could not stop these guys from doing it. It says in Acts chapter 17, or um, verse 5, But the Jews which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and brought uh, and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they had found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. Why are they causing all this trouble? Because these people have turned the world upside down. How did they turn the world upside down? They were, cha- they were making a difference. They were changing things. How did they do that? By preaching the gospel everywhere they went. Everywhere they went, they're preaching. But what was the result of it? They received persecution. What, and what is the mentality today? The mentality today is if people are saying bad things about a church, there must be something wrong with that church. I told you the other day about my wife. Somebody's like, you know, if, if I'm looking at a church, I look at their Facebook. And if they have negative reviews, I know that church has a bad testimony. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Look at the testimony that these guys had. These are troublemakers. They're turning the world upside down. We've got to stop them. I mean, they were beating them. They're persecuting them. And people today, it's like, you know, we've we got to figure out how we can get along with the community. You know, we can't preach too hard. You know, what, you know let's, let's show everybody we're friends. You know, let's bring in the mayor. Let's bring in the politicians. You know, let's go do all the community stuff. You know, instead of preaching the gospel, let's go to the fair and hand out bottles of water and just impress these people with our charm and bring them to Jesus that way. That is a joke. That is not what they did in the Bible. They preached the gospel everywhere they went. And you know what? It made people mad. And we don't go out and try to make people mad. But you know what? We do sometimes. And these guys, they got persecuted. Acts 16, 23. We're not going to take time to read the whole story. But Paul and Silas are going around preaching. They got that one possessed woman saved that had brought her masters much gain, and they got mad. They ended up laying stripes on them. They threw them into prison. And what did they do? They sang praises. They sang praises, and then you know the story. I mean, the earthquake came, the doors were open, and then they didn't even leave the prison. That jailer comes up to them. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And thy house. What did they do? They kept soul winning. They're not, they get the jailer saved. They go back home. His family gets saved. They're just preaching the gospel everywhere they go, but they're being persecuted as a result of it. And you know what? We're seeing more and more people who actually preach the truth. Are, and, and our persecution in America is not a big deal. Okay? No, I, I don't know anybody that's gotten beaten for their beliefs. You know, Most of what we get is verbal now. You know, you get, you get the negative media attention, but you know, that's all it takes for most preachers to completely cave. I mean, a bunch of negative reviews and what are they, you know, they're shutting down their Facebook page. Oh, we don't want people to see this. You know, they're putting, you know, they're putting their sermons password protected because you know, I, I, we, we can't handle all the backlash that we're getting from this stuff. And they're going into hiding like a bunch of cowards. But the Bible teaches these people, man, they were as public as all get out and they just preached everywhere they went and it made people mad. And as our country gets more and more wicked, it's what we do is where it's going to become less and less popular. And the new mentality today is, you know, get in good with the community, make everyone like you. And, you know, we'll get the big crowds, we'll have revival. But is that what happened in the book of Acts? Everyone would agree that revival was going on in the book of Acts, but they got persecuted everywhere they went. The Apostle Paul, one of the greatest Christians, you know how many negative reviews he would have had on Facebook? Do you know what people would have been saying about him on Twitter? 
Do you know how many people would be making videos against him on YouTube with the stuff that he was doing? I mean, the guy got beat over and over again, thrown in prison over and over again. And, you know, Pastor Trendy, he would have been preaching against him. And, you know what? I mean, Paul is bringing reproach on the name of Christ. He's making Christians look bad for preaching the truth. And unfortunately, we do. We, we think today, if we receive any persecution, you know, what's God trying to tell us? You know, what's going on? You know, why are we suffering like this? God told us that would happen. Hey, they hated me. They're going to hate you too. And we've got churches today. They can't figure out why they can't have revival. They can't figure out why God's not doing anything. Maybe it's because they're too busy trying to make the world like them instead of being obedient to God. God's not going to do anything in a church that the world loves. Bible says, love not the world. Either things are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Okay, the world's going to love their own. Okay? But they're not going to love us. We are different. We should not love the world, and the world's not going to love us. But somehow, we got that. people have got that mentality, and it's a joke. So what does revival look like? There's lots and lots of soul winning, and there's people, the people who are revived are being persecuted for it. And so, uh, just you know, keep that in mind. And then, chapter 15 of Acts, look over at Acts chapter 15. It says, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. You know what was going on right here? The, there was people, because once again, you know, the church is growing and it's making a difference. And so you know what happened? Evil men and seducers crept in unawares and started bringing in false doctrine. Okay. They brought, they're brought, they're bringing it into the place where things are happening, where things are right. They're bringing in this false doctrine saying, except you be circumcised. You know, you got to keep the law in order to be saved. That was a heresy, a great heresy. And you know what we see them doing here in the book of Acts? They stood up against it. They stood up against false doctrine. You know what they were doing? They were contending for the faith. And you, want to, you know what we see today in Baptist churches today? Nobody wants to argue about doctrine. Nobody wants to contend for the faith. Why can't we all just get along? Why do we have to be so divisive? You know, these preachers that are you know, standing against people, you know, they're so divisive. Well, who, where do we see in the Bible we're supposed to get along with everybody? The Bible tells us we're supposed to earnestly contend for the faith. And, and how, what, what does that look like? It means we're standing for do, pure doctrine. We're standing for the truths of the Word of God. But that's not going on today. We've got some of the craziest things ever being taught. You've got the trendies that are teaching this false grace. They're turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. And nobody wants to call it out. Because, you know, these trendies, you know, they, they're so good at acting like they're friends with everybody and they love everybody. And, you know, we, oh man, I, I can't pick on that guy. He's just so sweet and so nice. No, he's, he's a snake. He's a devil bringing in damnable heresies. We need to call these people out. We need to call out these preachers that are, you know, bringing in this crazy dispensational teaching. You know, the, the Sam Gipp teachings that, you know, we've been talking about. The craziness that Jesus isn't my Messiah. He's not your Messiah. Teaching Jesus was supposed to be called Jesus. And most Baptists today hear that. Uh, I, I don't agree with that. But they won't condemn them. I can't believe how many people I've come across and I've talked to that are not on our side when it comes to end times things. But they will tell me. That they think, guys, they think that Sam Gibbs a heretic. They think these Ruckmanites are a bunch of heretics. That they're doing a, I had one preacher, well-known preacher, who said, you know, those, those Ruckmanites have done a great deal of harm to the cause of Christ. I mean, and, but yet, why aren't they calling them out? Why aren't they contending for the faith? This guy preaches in the same churches that Sam Gipp preaches in. Why isn't he calling those preachers out and saying, why would you have me and him? We are nothing alike. Why would they do that? Why, why won't they do that? But you know why? Because a lot of these guys, they're in it for the money. And if they go ruffling feathers and causing problems, nobody's going to have them come into their meetings. Back to the sword of the Lord. You know, back in the day, the sword of the Lord, they were always fighting doctrinal things. They were always fighting about the big issues. There was always some kind of thing going on. 
Now, I, I get the sword of the Lord and revival fires all the time. They never talk about anything controversial. And you know what? It's boring. <laughs> they, they, don't, they don't talk about any of those things. You know why? Because if we make people mad, they're going to cancel subscriptions. And they're, they all need money. They all need money, so nobody wants to stand for anything. But listen, a place that's been revived, a place where the Holy Spirit is working, they are contending for the faith. And we see them doing that in the book of Acts. We see them doing that uh, in Acts 15, in Acts chapter 20, in verse 29. Uh, what Lost my spot in there. Turn over to Acts chapter 20, verse 29. And there's, there are several spots we could go to, but this was something that they constantly did. They contended for the faith. What does it mean to be content? What does it mean to contend? I think it's to be a little contentious. You know, it's, it's, just, it's part of it. You know, not contentious just for the sake of being contentious. There is a reason to fight sometimes, and there's a reason not to fight. But when it comes to doctrine, it matters. But it says in Acts 20, verse 29, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. What was he doing? He was contending for the faith and he's getting ready to leave. And he's like, I'm telling you, you all need to contend for the faith. There's going to be people that are going to come in and they're going to try to pervert your doctrine. Even amongst your own people, there's going to be men who are going to rise up. that are going to speak perverse things. Don't let it happen. But you know what? People like me, you know, we're looked at as the bad guys because we're calling out some of these preachers. You know, we're calling out these people. We're calling them heretics and things like that and saying people ought to have nothing to do with them because we're actually marking them like the Bible says and avoiding them like the Bible says. We're looked at as bad guys, but that's the sign of a church that's having revival. That's the sign. Of, that's what they did in the book of Acts. We don't have time to go to all the scriptures where they are. They're contending for the faith. They're making a big deal. Oh, you know, the, you know, these people are our brothers. We're going to be with them in heaven. Well, didn't the apostle Paul contend with Peter when Peter, you know, he was kind of sending a false message, kind of acting like a, you know, a Jew with the Jews trying to impress them. And the Bible says Paul was stood him to it. He said, I was stood him to his face for he was to be blamed. Sometimes even good people get caught up in things. And even Barnabas in that story, he got carried away with their dissimulation. And, they, and Paul and Barnabas, they had contention among the two of them. And they had to part ways. But understand, what Paul was doing was right. And people's like, no, we've got to have unity. We've got to have unity at all costs. You know, we don't we need to be dividing. No, we've got to have truth at all costs. We've got to have purity of the Scripture. And today, churches just aren't doing it. Pastors today, they don't preach on anything controversial. They're not going to preach in anything that's going to make their people uncomfortable. They don't talk about morality. They're not talking about shacking up. They're not talking about the television. They won't talk about drinking and smoking and all those. They don't talk about that stuff. They don't talk about standards and dressing like a Christian. You know, they don't talk about those things. They're not contending for the faith. But that's what goes on in a church that has been revived. That is what revival looks like. You've got lots and lots of soul winning. You're getting persecuted for it. You're going to be contending for the faith. Now listen, bad doctrine. It will make a church ineffective. And we see that in Galatians 5, 1-9. through I, I don't have time to go there. But we see also, the last thing, I want to get to this quick, that there was also an emphasis on holy living. Acts chapter 15. So th this isn't going on today. People aren't talking about this. You know, as long as you're in church, giving your tithe, we're paying our bills, we're good. Let's all just get along. We're all going to be in heaven together someday, so we might as well start getting along right now. You know, that, that's the attitude. But Acts 15 verse 19 says, Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols, from fornication, from things strangled from blood. What was going on here? They had the, in the same story where they were trying to teach you had to be circumcised to be saved and keep the law of Moses. This was going to be a great burden on these Gentiles. And, you know, even, even Peter, I believe it was Peter in this story. He's like, you know, hey, we couldn't even keep the law. You know, why are we going to burden them? Why are we going to ask them to do something that we can't do? Okay, because you don't get saved by the keeping of the law. No one gets saved. Following and so they told them, but let's, let's encourage them. Let's tell them to avoid fornication, pollutions of idols, all those things. Let's tell them those things because following those instructions, even those instructions, those were not requirements of salvation that they were giving. 
Those were not requirements of salvation, but they were required for being a part of the church. If you read Ephesians 5, 1 through 8, that passage, it's, uh, well, let's, let's turn over there. I need to show you this here. It's, this is important because people get the wrong idea about this passage. He says, be therefore, be therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us and offering a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know that no whoremonger nor unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them, for ye sometimes were darkness, but now are ye the light in the Lord. Walk as the children of light. People will take that passage there and say that if you're doing those things, you are not saved. A person who is saved will never do those things. But that's not what that passage is saying. These things were not requirements for salvation. If that were the case, then salvation is of the works of the law. What he was saying here is that, hey, the fornicators, the idolaters, all those people, they are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Okay? Sinners are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. All liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. We see the Bible says that. But wait a minute, we've all lied, so aren't we all liars? Well, yes, we all have broken the law, but here's the thing. When we got saved, the blood of Christ, it cleansed us from those things. Okay? We are clean. We are holy in Christ. Y'all understand that? So even if we have done some of those things, we are not those things. So why? So it is very serious that we not do those things. Okay. So, and a way to illustrate this as a parent, one of the things I'll often do, or and you probably do this too, is you'll tell your you know, children, don't do that. You know, you're a McMurtry. Now, what are we saying? Are we saying that McMurtry's are incapable of certain sins? No, we're not saying that. But what we're saying is, hey, we don't stand for this. This is something that we don't do. This is something that our family is against. And so you know what? You're a McMurtry act like a McMurtry. And you know what? As Christians, God has made us something else. God has made us new in Christ. Yes, physically, we're still capable of certain sins, but we have no business doing them because we are Christians. And if we start acting that way as believers in the church, you know what? You need to be removed from the church. And just like my kids, you know, if Tommy tried wearing high heels or something, I'm going to be like, hey, you're a McMurtry. You're not doing that. But if he insists on wearing high heels and being a transgender freak or something, guess what? He's going out of the house. All right? I'm sorry. I love my son, but he will not wear a dress in my house and high heels in my house. He's out. Is he not my son anymore? No, but you know, he can't have fellowship. I can't. If, if he's doing that, he's a pervert. Perverts will do anything to anybody. You know, He's got a brother. He's got sisters. I got to protect them. He's out of the house. And you know what? God's people, we're capable of certain things, but if it goes on, we're you got to get rid of them. You know why? Because we're supposed to have an emphasis on holy living. We're supposed to teach people to act like children of God and encourage them to do the right thing. Not as a requirement of salvation, not so we can go to heaven, but because th listen, that's what we are. We are saved. We are revived. We are children of God. It doth not yet appear what we shall be. But you know what? Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. That's what we're going to do. And that's what we're going to emphasize. But that is not being emphasized. No, it's all about grace. You know, you know, it's all about grace. You know, God's forgiven you. You know, all sin's the same. You know, sin, you know, don't worry about it. And they just let anything go on in church. Yeah, you're shacking up. Yeah, you know, you can still be part of our church. You can still be members. You can still sing in the choir. You know, the you know, some teenage girl's pregnant, they'll let her sing in the choir. You know, they'll let her play the piano. They'll let her do all those things, even though she's living in open sin. Oh, you know, how can we tell her that she's got, you know, she's, you know, out when she, you know, because other people have sinned too. It's just not as obvious. Yeah, she's pregnant. But if you look at a woman to lust, you've committed adultery in her heart. And, you know, what guy hasn't done that? Listen, there are specific things that God said you should be thrown out of the church for. Because 
we are supposed to be emphasizing holy living, and that is not going on today in a lot of churches. And these people, they're begging for revival. They're, how can we conjure up revival? You know, we, we got to, you know, let's do the fast. I mean, you know, they're pretty much doing everything short of like the prophets of Baal and jumping on the altar, cutting themselves. I mean, but if they thought that would work, I think they'd do that. <laughs> they, they're just, they're that desperate. And they don't realize that we've already been revived. The Holy Spirit is already here. And if we're not seeing what we should be seeing, if things aren't happening like they should be happening, it's because we are in disobedience to God. It's because we're walking in the flesh. And we don't need to conjure anything up. We don't need to bring in a, you know, that, that guest speaker that just knows how to get stuff out of people. You know what we just need to do? We need to start doing what we're supposed to do. We don't need to wait for anything to just go giving people the gospel. Just do it. Just nothing's stopping us from doing it. We have the Holy Spirit. You're saved. We know what, if you're saved, you know, you know how to get saved. You should know how to tell somebody to get saved. Just go do it. And you know what? If you do it, you're probably going to get some persecution. But you know what? Praise the Lord when you get persecuted. Your reward is going to be great in heaven. And you know what? You need to contend for the faith. When you hear, and, and if you go soul winning, you're going to be contending for the faith. Because what is it we constantly hear? How, how does a person get to heaven? Well, just be good. Do the right thing. And we're nice about it. But you know what we do? We tell them, no, that's actually not it. This, you know what, what we're doing? We're contending for the faith. We got to tell people the truth. And, P, and we're, we tell people they're wrong. We're, we got to tell them, hey, your Catholicism's not going to get you to heaven. Your priest can't forgive you of your sins. What are we doing? We're contending for the faith. And, that is, and people are scared to death of that. We've got to have that emphasis on holy living. We talked about this morning. We're looking for that blessed hope. What is that blessed hope? That one of these days we're going to be like Christ. And so we've got, we've got to focus on these things. And so, uh, you know, Baptists, we've got to get over this mindset of trying to conjure up revival. Uh, Pastor, I, I want great things to start happening here. You know, I think we need to plan a revival meeting so God can give us revival. No, if you want revival, go soul winning. Go give somebody the gospel. That, that's, what, that's what it is. That's what it looks like. Oh, well, I, I tried that. I, I got persecuted. Somebody chewed me out. Good. That's called revival right there. Uh, you know, these people, you know, they're, they're, uh, people are arguing with me about, you know, what gets a person to heaven. I, I don't think it's, you know, I, I, I'm uncomfortable with that. No, that's good. That's called, that means you were contending for the faith. That's what revival looks like. You know, you know it, all, these, these are, th that's what it looks, that's what went on in the book of Acts. And that's what we're trying to emphasize around here. And that's what we've got to do. We're not going to conjure anything up. That's just a joke. You know, revival is not something that we're just supposed to sit around waiting for. They were supposed to do that in Acts. Jesus told them, you know, tarry in Jerusalem until the Comforter comes. But guess what? He came. And he's still here. He didn't go anywhere. If we're not seeing what we're not supposed to be seeing, it's because we're not doing what we're supposed to do. If you're saved, you've been revived. You just need to walk in the Spirit. But you've got to understand, revival comes with a price. And these people, they paid a price on earth, but you know what? Their reward's great in heaven. And so, listen, I refuse to sit around waiting for revival. I refuse to participate in trying to conjure up revival. You know what I'm just going to do? I'm just going to do what I'm supposed to do. I'm going to keep giving the gospel every chance I get. I'm going to keep on contending for the faith. I'm going to keep on emphasizing holy living. And when the persecution comes my way, I'm not going to cry about it. I'm going to praise the Lord for it. Because I want... I want to live revival. I want to experience revival. And that's what it looks like. Not a big, emotional, hugging, crying, laughing fest. That, that is not anywhere in the Bible. And if, if I wanted to, I, I've been in enough camp meetings. I think I know how I could get you all excited a little bit. I might even be able to get one of you to jump in the baptistry. You know? And a lot of people would call that revival, and it would help my popularity because, man, that church is having revival. Did you see that guy jump in the baptistry? You know, I mean, you know, did you see that guy do the somersault on the platform? You know, I mean, the whole, that guy's full of the Holy Spirit when he was preaching. Did you see him do the cartwheel? I could work on my cartwheels and do that stuff, and people would think I'm full of the Holy Spirit. I could move up the ranks in fundamentalism. But is that revival? Absolutely not. Let's get our mindset right in this thing. And nobody, we're done waiting for revival revivals it's here it's ready if you're saved you've been revived the holy spirit's here and if you don't like what you're seeing then you know what walk in the spirit start being obedient and we'll get to enjoy the benefits of it 
And so with that, let's all stand together.